Lovely. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us again today. We've got another great webinar tonight. Um, and we'll just let everyone join in. There's a lot of people registered for tonight's webinar, so we'll give everyone a minute or so, and then we'll get started. So, Dimi, is that your office? Your where This is, is that? Uh, my spare room, my study. Okay, you've got a study, very nice. Well, spare room. <laughs> Turned it into a study. There's a desk and a mantelpiece with the flowers. <laughs> where are you in your... Oh, just in the sitting room. So, I'm middle of moving house, so it's all... Oh, yeah, of course. That people can't see things. <laughs> That's good, you got to carefully position the camera. <laughs> yes. Lovely. Hello, everyone. There's still quite a few people joining, so we'll give everyone a few minutes and mm. then we'll get started. Just before we get started, I'd really appreciate if you can all read this slide that's up at the moment. Essentially, the important point is there's a lot of clinical images, as always, in this talk especially, and there are lots of images that Mr. Nikai himself has taken, um, and he has personal ownership of them, but they're not to be posted on social media in particular and even not to be taken pictures of for your own records as well. So I'd really appreciate if you do take any pictures, perhaps just the title slide at the start of the webinar, just if you want to post that on social media. But otherwise, please refrain from taking any pictures of the slides and especially from posting those on social media. Otherwise, as always, if you have any questions that you want us to ask Mr. Nicker at the end of his talk, if you post these on the Q&A function, we'll ask as many as we can at the end of the talk. Um, I think his talk is around 45, 50 minutes, and then we'll have 10, 15 minutes for questions at the end. So we'll get through as many as we can. Thank you, Demi. Lovely. So I think everyone's seen that slide. I'll stop sharing so Darish can share his screen as well. And while he's doing that, I'll introduce him. So Mr. Darish Nicker is a consultant, plastic and hand surgeon who's working at the Royal Free Hospital in London, UK. Um, he's done a lot of cases of replants and revascularizations through his training um, and more recently as a consultant at the Royal Free. And he's also even written a book on hand trauma, which is published by team. And I'd really recommend everyone who's coming up to the exam or just for their own clinical practice who has an interest in hand trauma or wants to learn more about it to go and buy this book. I've got a copy and it's it's really good. A lot of pictures, simple descriptions, makes everything seem easy, but it's obviously a lot more difficult in real life. So we'll see a lot yeah. of examples of stuff today, but his book is the place to go. And I don't know if he'll mention that later, but otherwise we can send a link for that as well, perhaps at the end. Am I, um, am I sharing with you yet, Dimi? He's not sharing just now. One second. Let me just get back. Okay. One second. So share screen. Go to here. Perfect. Excellent. Sorry about that. That's working well. So I'll hand over to you, Darish. Thank you. It's, very much. it's quite a thanks for the intro, introduction, Dimi. So it's quite a big area. So I'm going to talk about uh, replantation and revascularization, and some. It's a. It. I think the talk will be uh, useful for those coming up to their FRCS exam, and also a technical talk as well, just to help you in the event that you do get a replant or revask in your training. And um, um, it's often something with, which um, the registrar sometimes left to do. Um, so I will, I will try to, to, to help you um, just go through certain tips and tricks that I've learned in my training from, from uh, many surgeons. So the overview of the talk will be indications that I looked at to replant digits or, or revascularize digits. Um, and the technique, um, some, some stuff about post-operative care, uh, papers regarding outcomes, um, key papers, I'll go through quite a few papers that will be helpful for you guys to read, and also some case scenarios which can be helpful in the, in the Viva setting for the exam. So this is an excellent article by Wayne Morrison, written way back in 2007 about digital replantation. And it's quite, it's, it's a very good read. He's a great writer. He says, emergency surgery is learnt in the trenches after hours and without supervision. Ideally, it should be supervised, but so that the replantation is, wheel is reinvented with every new resident rotation. And interestingly, he goes on, long-term results in replantation 
uh, may take years to stabilize and perhaps reasonably we assume that survival of the digit equates to success. And many papers uh, don't talk about long-term outcomes and we you know, replant a digit as a registrar and we sometimes don't you know, follow them up or see them in clinic long-term. So I'll be talking about that later in the talk. So this is a great paper and it's got a little case in uh, the way Morrison talks about a, a tug of war between two sides uh, in an Argentinian tug of war. This is a personal c communication. And the two sides, unfortunately, the, the rope broke and they had ring avulsions. 20 fingers were avulsed. And unfortunately, a bystander just picked, picked them all up thinking they were doing the right thing. And unfortunately, when it came to replanting the digits, they didn't know which digit belonged to who. So that was um, something he'd written about. And I, was, I thought that was quite a, a fantastic case, which unfortunately had a bad outcome. So looking at replantation versus amputation. So there's some things that you've got to do everything you can uh, to try to re replant. So thumb, 40% of hand function. Children, they have immense re-innovation and they usually do quite well. Uh, Multi-digit amputations, particularly transmetacarpal, People who've got jobs such as musician, surgeon, um, uh, amputations distal to the FDS insertion, my hands do well, and guillotine amputations through the wrist and forearm. There are things that you should consider not replanting. If the amputated part has a poor condition, if there's pro prolonged ischemic time, particularly in a, in a macro replant, you've got you've to you know, save the patient, not just think about Re saving the limbs, patient first. And some avulsion crush injuries are very difficult to save. Um, and single digit amputations proximal to the PIP joint. I have had good results in some cases. This is a relative indication for amputation, but if it's a manual worker, they may want to get back to work and uh, you know quickly. So that may not be a, um, uh, something that would be suitable, depends on the patient. And multiple segmental injuries, I'll show um, this uh, a case that uh, I saw on fellowship. And patients with significant comorbidities and psychologically unstable patients. So you've got to, you've got to weigh things up and you can't replant everything. So this is a case recently um, done at the Royal Free. Um, a patient who had a, a near amputation of the thumb devascarized for about 24 hours. You've got to do everything you can to save it. And, and we did. Um, but I mean, if you, if you didn't save this, you've got to think of doing something. It's a big area. So that the best thing would probably be a pulp transfer. So this was a young uh, manual worker and we have, we have to save it. So risk factors for failed digital replantation. So smoking is one. There's a, there's a, uh, kind of not a, much agreement in the literature. Some papers say that it's not a risk factor, but a lot of uh, recent papers in Journal of Hand Surgery do say it is a risk factor. Um, avulsion injuries, prolonged ischemic time, and, and age over 50. So this is a case that I experienced when I was a senior registrar. So this chap has had a, a very big magnitude injury. So he's had all four fingers avulsed in the machinery. And you can see the red arrow there, the bruises there show that the, the, the zone of injury is right up to the DIPJ. So tried everything to try, you know, think, thinking outside the box to save this heterotopic replantation, um, even ectopic replantation. But looking through the digits, there was only one that had suitable vessels. And in the end, we decided to do something Quite, uh, quite practical. He wanted to eventually get back to work. Also, this x-ray is quite uh, disappointing as well because it's right through his joints. So we'd have to, if we had to fuse it, we'd have to do vein grafts on each, each digit and fuse each digit. Um, and uh, in the end, what we decided to do was a pedicle groin flap and preserve that length. Um, I mean, now there's, I, I mean, at the time, I think the most suitable thing was to do a pedicle groin flap. You can, and I have done this before, is to do a free flap um, and use that to cover um, uh, the digits and then syndactylize it. 
uh, desyndactylize them. But this guy did well eventually. Um, I mean, we preserved length and he got back to work. Um, but it, it's, it's hard to say whether it was feasible to put these back on. I, I, don't, think, uh, I don't think it would have been suitable in his case. This is another uh, difficult injury that I saw in fellowship. Unfortunately, I wasn't there in the original case. I was doing a flap in another theater. This guy came in, his arm had been ripped off in machinery and uh, he had a multi-level injury. The decision was made not to replant. Um, and actually we should have, we made a mistake. I wasn't there, but uh, we should have thought outside the box and used the arm as spare parts to cover the stump. You can see the stump has got a bit of bone exposed and we need to save the elbow. So in the end, what, what I did was to do a free LD flap to cover the stump. Um, so spare parts may be from the amputated part to save it. Um, but this was a, a pretty nasty injury. We could, have, we could have had a go and shortened the limb, but he was, he'd lost quite a lot of blood. He was quite unwell. So they, they took the safe option. Um, so assessing these patients. So you've got to assess hand dominance. Is it their dominant hand, their occupation? Mechanism of injury, on the right you can see this patient has had a machete injury uh, to his arm. So it's a sharp uh, laceration, guillotine amputation, everything's been cut very precisely. There's a, only a dorsal skin bridge left. Um, and um, what's their physical state? Are they a fit and well patient? Sometimes these patients come into the major trauma centers and you don't know anything about them. They don't even have a name. It's John Doe, but uh, uh, try to find information. And psychology, uh, how, is this patient able to, to have his finger or his arm or his hand replanted? And therapy. These patients need to have therapy. The reason I say this, in this case, this guy had unfortunately murdered someone and then he uh, got, before he got tasered by the police, he tried to amputate his own hand off for some reason. And uh, he, we revast this finger. This was again as a senior uh, registrar, and we saved saved his hand. But he had no therapy. He went to prison, and then I saw him at follow up. I think three four months, just hand motionless. So the therapy is really important. It doesn't matter how beautiful a repair you do. This is something quite in the assessment. If you've got a partially amputated digit and you're not sure, put this. Uh, pulse oximetry on. It will tell you whether uh, the digit is ischemic. It's a nice paper from PRS. Um, all the digits that weren't ischemic had sats of minimum of 95%. If it's not picking up anything, take the patient to theatre. It's a really nice objective way of measuring um, uh, whether a digit is vascularized. And also pre-op management. So when patients um, come to you from another center, just make sure that the part is uh, uh, taken care of properly. So amputated parts, saline moist gauze in a sealed bag on ice. Um, the, this, the group from East Grinstead had a nice little protocol for pre-op management. So if it's an isolated, is it an isolated injury? For your exams, you often have to mention you go through ATLS. The mechanism of injury, is it guillotine or avulsion? Photography, telemedicine, that's key. Um, a telemedicine can tell you how urgent this is, when, what level it is, so you should have photography in your department. We mentioned temperature control um, and obviously uh, getting that patient as soon as possible uh, to the plastics center. So there has also been a lot of discussion in the literature about whether delaying replantation. So uh, there is a paper I'll discuss later by the Chelmsford group, but also a paper by Cavadas that say that if you delay replantation, um, well, if it comes in the middle of the night, it's a safe approach and there's no difference um, in outcomes in terms of survival. Um, but you've got to be careful. You don't want to delay everything. I mean, if it's coming at 10 o'clock at night and it's a single digit replant, you can do that in two to three hours. You don't want to delay it eight hours to the next day. You'll increase the ischemic time, more chance of ischemia reperfusion injury. This is an excellent paper that I recommend you all read from uh, Dotel's group. 
going through the surgical technique and indications of replantation, um, beautiful illustrations. And um, um, I think it's in the, the journal May of Changes Thane, Surgery de la Man, 2013. And these are another two papers, uh, one by Jimbo Tang and one recently by Wu, just talking about efficiency and success in upper, upper limb replantation. A lot of the groups in, in uh, the Far East have got um, uh, high success rates in terms of salvaging uh, replanted digits. And it's probably some, some of it's to do with cultural things as well, um, but great videos in this, which I recommend. So in that article by Dotel, um, he goes through this disciplined routine, which I will illustrate in, in, in pictures. Um, and you, you'll need to explain this in the exam. Um, so your evaluation and exposure of the digit uh, skeletal shortening is really important. Fixation method often just a single KY. Flexor tendon repair I'll go through. In children you'll be able to repair the periosteum because um, it's thicker. Uh, nerve repair, there's no point in replanting a digit if you're not going to repair the nerve because it'll be insensate and useless and basically they'll want it amputated. Arterial repair, I've got some videos and tips and tricks to show you on that. And also the venous repair and extensor tendon repair. So ischemic time, you've got in a digital repunt 12 hours warm ischemic time, 24 hours um, cold ischemic time, 96 hours has been reported by groups in Taiwan, and even longer than that. And I've seen cases of that in my training as well. Um, for macro replants, uh, you've got less time because of muscle. So you want to do it in the first couple of hours, up to six hours really, but you've got to do it quickly. Um, there are groups in Taiwan that have looked at cases where you've had protracted ischemia more than 24 hours. Success rate is lower, so 64, 64%. So that's why I think you've got to be careful to delay replantation. Um, and um, although let's say in the middle of the night, you won't have a familiar team, you may not have um, seniors on board, um, but I, th I think uh, you've got to be careful uh, delaying it. So this was a summary of their failed and failures and successes. There you can go another, this is a case report in a PRS about cryopreserving digits, which I found interesting. Two cases, one at 81 days and one at five days, two-step approach. Um, I think one of the patients had psychiatric issues, uh, but interestingly, I mean, they, they followed this patient up 14 years later. The digit is slightly atrophied, um, but that's, that's interesting. I'm not sure if we'd be able to do that in the UK. Um, so this is, a, this is a paper that I came across recently by a group in San Francisco from the Bunky Clinic. And he's an excellent speaker and talker, Babak Safa. He runs the Bunky lectures. And he, he talks about a stepwise approach in replantation and things that he's done to, to speed the process up. So very similar to, to what I'll talk about in the next pictures. So you've got to prepare the amputated part while the patient is going to sleep. Prepare it with a small microset under the microscope. It's best to do under the microscope. I used to do it under my loops, but it's easier to do under the microscope. Tack all the structures, neurovascular bundles, veins, takes you 30 minutes. And remember, if a part is in pieces, there may be something you can take from it. And it's, you know, salvage parts from that. And this is a nice little way of doing this. This is you can use vascular sloops, and um, if you don't have an assistant, it just stabilizes the part. Um, and this is the tagging table that I'm, I'm showing. This is when I was a hand fellow at East Grinstead. You've got um, pieces, um, uh, the macro instruments and the micro instruments. And remember, if it's, a, if it's a macro replant, ask the anesthetist to do a block. That helps in vasodilation, get the mini C arm ready, and you know, prepare the, the micro, prepare the part under the microscope. Here you can see I've extended the wound with midlateral incisions and I'm pointing to the dorsal veins, um, nerves, and the arteries are marked. And there is an old paper that says that midlateral is easier to identify vascular structures. Um, I find it useful. Um, these surgeons in Philadelphia 
found it um, easier to identify structures. Um, and bony osteosynthesis, well, one of the important things is shorten the bone. Um, it helps tensionless repair, digital replant, um, more proximal replants. And often I just go for K-wire fixation. You can also use interosseous wiring described by Lister. Um, plate, I have seen that, but it's more dissection and it takes longer. So I would, I would avoid using that. I use K-wires. Um, you can use cannulated screws and we've described that for the revask and replant setting. Um, it gives you very rigid fixation. It's quite fast as well. But bone shortening is very, very important. We looked at two groups when I, when I was at East Grinstead and what the group that had the bones shortened, um, they, they had less failure rate. Obviously this is a small study, but apparently we've got more data coming out from three centers that also um, shows that this, this to be true. And I think it, less chance of having to use vein grafts um, and um, I mean, small data, but we found a significance there. Um, interosseous wiring, I think you should all be able to, to do this or describe this. It's rapid, it's simple, it's cheap, and you don't necessarily need to do a radiograph. And the groups in Taiwan use this quite commonly for, for toe transfer and for replantation. So you need to prepare the recipient site. I usually mark vein grafts over the distal third of the forearm. And you can see I've gone outside um, of the zone of trauma, preparing the, ampute uh, the, the site of osteosynthesis, just stabilizing the bone and just cutting it with the um, with, uh, oscillating saw. And this is a nice little tip, um, useful also if you're gonna do a, a toe transfer as well, if you want to get um, uh, the bone kind of nice and flush. So uh, I learned this off one of my teachers at the Royal London. Um, so you can put a glove and make a small aperture through it and then cut that bone protecting the, the structures. I remember one of the first replants I did when uh, many, I think it must be seven years ago and making a mistake of injuring one of the neurovascular bundles because it wasn't protecting it in a method like this. So you can do it on the amputated piece like that as well. And here use 9090 wiring. You can use parallel wire, wires as well. And interestingly, there is, a, there is a paper from Bunky's group looking that they had the, if you use this type of fixation, um, you had lower, they had lower um, kind of complications in terms of uh, non-union, but they had very high um, problems with bony union. And it would be interesting to see what, you have to do a multi-center study to see what the bone complications are. So there's bony problems were seen in 50% of their replants, probably fibrous unions um, and uh, not possibly non-unions as well. So if you, often I do K wiring, you need to get good bone on bone contact. Sometimes just a single K wire is enough, but, um, uh, and also more proximal amputations. You may, uh, you may see this um, more frequently in the trauma centers, in uh, non-trauma centers in the UK, with, you see less of these injuries. This guy has had a near total amputation through his carpus. And interesting, the cut is perfect. It's all laid out to do a proximal row carpectomy, which is a very useful uh, thing to do because it shortens everything. And then you can use a plate uh, to, to fix the wrist. Um, you can do that yourself. And if uh, the orthopedic team are around, uh, they can help you as well because you want to do this fairly rapidly. And if you do have the un unlikely event that you amputate 10 fingers, there are pictures of that. It seems to happen a lot in, in as some parts of the world. Um, you can use a structure by structure method to, to replant these digits. But if there's a long ischemic time, go for the things that are really important. So the thumb is 40% of hand function. So replant that first and then the index and so forth. Um, so this is a paper by Jimbo Tang, that paper that I mentioned right at the uh, beginning, a global approach to digital replantation. So once you've done the osteosynthesis, which is really important, it's the kind of the foundation sequence of the replant, you're going to repair the tendons. Often you just repair the FDP, 
because you're going to get adhesions, you're going to get problems um, if you repair both. And a lot of people come back and they have tenolysis, so it's going to make things difficult. Try to preserve as much sheath as you can, at least the A2 pulley here. Um, and then you're on to repair uh, the nerves and the artery. The nerves, try to repair them under bloodless field, under the tourniquet. Um, you may need to do a nerve graft or even do uh, transfer the nerve enter side if it's avulsed onto a common digital nerve. The arterial repair should be tensionless. And I'll talk about how to um, avoid vein grafting if it's a small gap. Um, you can mobilize the nerve by dissecting it backwards. And Borbak Safa talks about that in his, his paper as well. Um, and when you're when you're about to do the anastomosis, I think you should really test if you've got good proximal flow. Um, also under the microscope, you need to be able to see if there's any damage to the, to the vessel and resect it back. And that comes with experience. You just cut it back. And here, in this case, uh, this was a ring avulsion. I'll show you the case later on. We just did a vein graft. You can see one of the nerves is still intact on one side. So the posterior wall first technique, which that's what I used for the arterial repair and replantation was described again by Bunke's group. Um, they described it for replantation. I use it for free flaps. Um, it's, it's the best way really to do micro I find because you do the most difficult stitches first and in a confined space, you don't need to use double clamps and rotate around. And they had an amazing success rate, 97%. Um, in 31 fingers. This was written in 1981 before I was born. So British Journal of Plastic Surgery. And this is a nice video that I made. And um, I think I wrote with my friend Gio on posterior wall anastomosis and it'll be coming on PRS, just a video of how to do it in a, in a replant. So here's the, the video. And um, obviously you've got to you take your time, clean the adventitia, um, Put the most difficult stitch in first. So he's giving it a clean, put the most difficult stitch in. And obviously I've checked that, that there's good squirting coming from the other side. So put that stitch in. I think I'm using a tenno here. The more distal you go, distal to the DIP joint, you, you're going to have to be using 11o. More proximal you can get away with 9o. And and once you put this stitch in, um, and then you just one stitch on either side, and then you finish with kind of a looped stitch. I think I've got it here, a loop stitch, a Harashina stitch, just to prevent you getting to the back wall. And I find that really, it's a nice way of doing things, the posterior wall technique, and it'll take you seven to 10 minutes to do. Um, sometimes when you're very distal, you've got to use very fine instruments. So it's essentially super microsurgery because it's less than one millimeter. So uh, nerve gaps, some solutions, enter side nerve repair. Sometimes that's useful. You can get a static two point discrimination of 10 millimeters. Nerve grafts, I usually take them either from the back of the wrist or um, from the forearm. The tip is to look for the veins and they usually run with those. And obviously don't throw things away. If there's amputated bits you can't reattach, just, just um, use those spare parts. Um, dorsal veins. So once you've, you've revascularized the finger, um, I, I close the skin on the volar side. You can use the microscope to close the skin with some 6-0 nylon. And then find the adipofascial, uh, in the adipofascial tissue, some of the, uh, the dorsal veins, usually quite large at that level in, in this, uh, this level at the base of the P1. Um, if it's a big vein, just do one. Um, but if it's, um, if it's uh, small veins, I try to repair two. Um, and here's a volar vein. You can use them. This is for a, a free venous flap that I, I've done. They're much smaller than volar veins. And usually for more distal replants, um, you can use them and it's been described. Sometimes if you've got a more proximal amputation, let's say through the MCP joints, it may be more prudent to do the veins first, do two veins first, and then do the artery. Um, wound closure. This is really important. I've lost fingers like this by closing tightly. Um, try to, this is a case that done recently where 
um, just put some split thickness skin graft over the veins. Um, you can also uh, remove the nail in anticipation if you're worried that this is um, going to be something that you need to chemically leach. Um, and so wound closure is important. And make sure when you put the dressing on, you don't put gelinette circumferentially. You've got a blood cast. Um, so you've got to, you've got to take care. Um, so patients often, often stay at least for a couple of days. Usually day three, I think, is a good day. Um, that they're, they're safe. They're almost out of the woods. Um, you've got to keep the patient warm and well hydrated to prevent vasospasm. Anticoagulation protocols, there's, there's not much consensus out there. Um, we, I'll mention a, a paper that actually Dimi uh, wrote. Um, leaching, get the leeches ready. I usually order them um, on, the, on the day just in case um, and obviously cover with Cipro. And you can do controlled bleeding with heparin soaks as well. That's another way of doing things. But you've also got to monitor these patients' um, hemoglobin, particularly if they're children, because the hemoglobin will drop remarkably. So you've got to, you've got to keep an eye on things. So we did a systematic review in PRS Open, and um, we found that actually there's no consensus in the literature. Everyone's got their own thing, but there are side effects, systemic side effects, particularly with IV heparin. So be careful when you use it. I usually use uh, prophylactic low molecular weight heparin and aspirin. Um, and in the last couple of cases, that's what I've done. So reasons for failure, you will get failures. And that's how you, you come better. You think about what you did wrong and what you can do better the next time. So there's often patient factors we've mentioned. Um, so smoke, uh, uh, also it could be crush, avulsion injury, um, and damage ex uh, across an extended surface. Um, and also technical problems with anastomosis, that, that can often be the case as well. Um, vein graft thrombosis, that can happen. And warm ischemic time. So this was a patient that I did as a, a registrar, I remember, and he had an extended is ischemic time. And also, I, I probably should have uh, plugged things on to a different vessel. That's what I should have done. Um, but uh, so this is probably what I should have done. There's a crust arterial anastomosis. And if you remember back to the thumb in the fourth slide, this is what we did to save that thumb. You can do this. If one blood vessel is not very useful, you can do a crossed arterial anastomosis, or you can do a jump vein graft and hook that up uh, to um, the radial artery in the snuff box. And I've done a couple of those for thumb replants and thumb rebasks, and it works well. Described way back in the 80s um, by um, uh, the, the group, I think, in New York. Um, you can actually put the vein graft, which you take from the volar forearm, and extend it, um, uh, essentially put it on bef before you uh, do the osteosynthesis. So you've got that, that there in place. It also makes it much easier to do the micro. You can do the micro with the hand rested and pronated downwards. Um, this is a guy who had um, a ring avulsion to his thumb, and I did a vein graft, but on the radial digital artery. He didn't have a on the digital artery. They're all, they're all gone. But the positioning for the micro for this was quite difficult. So you can do this venous bridge uh, grafting with thumb replantation, which is nothing new. These guys uh, from the Mayo who described it are basically describing what these guys in Manchester did in 1983. Um, so they had pretty good success rate. 10 hours one of them took. So, I mean, that's maybe they had to redo it a couple of times. I think for a thumb, you've got to really try because um, if you lose the thumb, then you've got to be thinking about, you know, doing toe transfer if it's, if it's suitable to the patient. So this is just a little diagram of how it works. So usually the ulnar digital artery is the dominant one in the thumb and you can put the hand flat and enter, enter side to the radial artery this is just a, a, a case scenario. So we've opened up the uh, snuff box here and taken a vein graft and put it on here. And I think you can see a video of it pulsating away with some music. And this, he was discharged on day three. So just a brief mention on distal replantation. 
I don't think we do that much distal replantation in the UK. Um, it's more common, I think, in the Far East. Um, you've got to know your anatomy here because often you've got to um, do the replant onto the central artery. When you're in uh, to my zone one, you may be able to just do an artery only. Um, and it's quite difficult using 110 or 120 can take you two to three hours. At that level, you may just consider doing a local flap um, and you may get similar outcomes. And one of my old bosses from East Grinster TCTO, I think mentioned this in a webinar, you may get similar outcomes just doing a, a uh, a small Segmuller flap or a Venkat Swami flap, and it will take much less time. Patient wouldn't have to stay in, um, have problems like that. Or you could just terminalize the digit and they may just want to go back to work quickly if they're a manual laborer. Um, it's easier to do the replantation Tamai zone two. I think you can do a vein and um, artery there. These digits that have been replanted, I think this is from a paper by Jimbo Tang, spectacular that they managed to get it work. They look, they don't look like guillotine amputations. They look like crush, crushed amputations. So uh, amazing there. Um, we've mentioned the distal transverse arch, which is important. Um, and obviously a different men mentality between the two camps in Europe and Asia. Success rates are different. We've audited um, big units here. It's usually the success rate here is 70%. In Asia, they report 98%. But in terms of success, it's not necessarily always survival um, because long-term follow-up is needed, whether those digits are useful and whether the patients wanted them amputated. And obviously, cultural differences are important. So this is a young boy who had an amputation through his um, thumb. I mean, like the picture at the beginning, I showed you the distal replant we could have replanted it, but I think he's probably had a, a similar outcome by just doing a local flap. And I'm sorry, I don't have long-term pictures, but I know he did well. Um, so distal fingertip amputation, this is right through that Tamai level, level one. Um, it's quite difficult to replant at this level, I, I personally think. You can do that through the central artery here. Um, you can also use this technique described by Henk Gill. Um, so doing a local advancement flap and taking that piece and defatting it and removing um, as much tissue as you can and putting it on as a composite graft. So you have a more of basically a vascularized bed uh, to increase that donor graft interface. And that's a, that's a nice thing to do, I think, in children. I think composite graphs work better in children. In adults, I haven't had good experience. Um, this is a, a big article by the team in Chelmsford, and it's an interesting article. It, it says that basically replantations done in daylight hours when feasible with rested staff and a full complement of theater team are likely to have better outcomes. Possibly true. Um, and also the warm ischemia time of uh, less than six hours 30 is a predictive factor of survival. However, the, the thing is, in the 75 cases they looked in this paper, 70% survived, but sadly there's no objective or subjective outcome measures in this paper. And it's true to a lot of papers on replantation. So nothing on sensation, range of motion, pain. So we've got to move away from survival without restoration of function is not success. So we've got to uh, look at that and probably through the RSTN and um, multi-center that we've got to do that. So this is a good paper by my friend Dan Saleh and he says, you should read this article, you should move away just from you know, flap or replant success and ask, you know, are they using it? Are they back to work? Do they want to keep it? So it shouldn't just be about success or failure. We need to, um, I recommend people to read this, it's a good article. So in terms of outcomes, uh, success rate, uh, guillotine um, usually does better. And there is good data coming out and paper that we're about to, to publish that shows this. Um, and also approximately 70% of patients achieve about a two point discrimination of I'd say 10 to 15 millimeters. Children usually have remarkable um, uh, static two-point discrimination after replantation up to five millimeters. And secondary sur surgery, often patients do need tenolysis, and uh, there's, there's groups that have shown up to 60% of cases. 
So I'm going to go over some case scenarios now as well, but just to summarize, you need to consider patient factors before replantation, the nature of the injury, and uh, some cases may be salvaged, but at what functional advantage essentially, um, and you need to follow a disciplined uh, systematic routine, particularly in micro. Um, and uh, so these are some of the case scenarios that may be helpful uh, for those doing vivas or if you get challenging cases like these. So this is a guy, he's a chef and he's partially amputated his finger. There's only a volar skin bridge left. You can see the finger is devascularized. And actually this is more difficult than a replant because with a replant, you can shorten it easily. You know, you wanna keep that, that little bridge maybe so you don't have to do a vein or two. Maybe it'll cost, save you an hour. So what I did here was just kept it simple, cross K wires, repaired the tendon, repaired the nerve, and then the artery wouldn't reach. So this is something that very simple that you can do is just dissect out the artery and use those micro ligger clips um, and just uh, release all the side branches. And then it just re reached. And then we got it um, uh, vascularized here. Um, there's a bit of sound in the theater, but you can see. That's fine. Okay. And a bit of disagreement in theater there. So um, arm revascularization case. This is a case that you may be called to. So patient has fallen out of a window. It's got a glass pane laceration over his elbow right down to bone. So you've got to extend the wound here. And you know, ischemic time, we're not sure what it is. Um, but here you can see a double clamp is on there. It's too tight. You've got to do a vein graft. Ideally, take the vein graft from the arm. You can take it from the leg, but actually the saphenous vein is much thicker. Um, so it's, if you can, take it from the arm. And I just do a fasciotomy. Well, there's nothing to, to lose. Um, if you're uncertain, just do a fasciotomy because I have seen cases which I'll show that you can have problems in. So this was reperfused and we completed the fasciotomy, released the carpal tunnel. And uh, I think a, a couple of days later, we partially closed it and he had a skin graft. And, you know, it shouldn't take long to do this uh, an hour. If it's coming to you as an emergency, you, you've got to just essentially uh, get it running. You can use a shunt, but it's not going to take you long to do this. Um, and uh, in terms of uh, the SATS probe, it's very useful at the end of the case. This is another case, um, just using a SATS probe just to monitor the, the finger fingers and see if the, the arm is well perfused. So this patient actually, case on fellowship, and uh, not done by myself, but uh, has had a, a chop saw injury to the forearm. And unfortunately, uh, he didn't have a fasciotomy. Everything was repaired, um, but no fasciotomy. I think he developed compartment syndrome. And interestingly, the team on the wards, um, they were pricking his finger and it was bleeding, but the SATS probe wasn't reading anything. His, his arm was probably perfused by collateral circul circulation and unfortunately lost all of that volar compartment. And what did was a flow through ALT, raised a flow through ALT, to, to cover the soft tissue defect. And most likely, I mean, this was about a year or so ago, um, he'll probably need a functional muscle um, to, for that. Um, and macro replants, um, I don't see many of these because I don't work in a major trauma center, but um, th these cases can occur. This is a case again as a registrar. This lady's had a crush avulsion injury and it, shortening the bone is really helpful in these cases. So you've got to shorten it up to eight to 10 centimeters, which was done in this case. And you've got to do the fixation pretty rapidly, get the orthopedic team there. And you can put a shunt in. That's what we did while we're doing the osteosynthesis. And you've got to mobilize the vessels together, and ideally do it end to end. Um, and you can see the magnitude of this injury maybe because, I mean, you can see all of those, those nerve strands from the brachial plexus just everything has been evolved. So survival, but maybe with not much function. Um, and always remember to do fasciotomies at the end of these cases. So ring avulsion injury, these cases you will see, you've got to re read uh, James Urbaniak's paper. I've heard him lecture, he's a great lecturer as well. 
I heard him lecture in Las Vegas, I think in 2013. So in this case, this is a class two Urbaniac. So it's, the circulation is, uh, it's not, um, it, well, it's not flowing um, and vessel repair is needed. And then you can get complete degloving as well. So this was the case that I showed you where I took the Ackland off and it shows blood squirting out. So you can see that gap in the, in the vessel um, there. And you can see the ulnar digital nerve is the only thing that's, that's working. And the finger is, it's ischemic. Usually with these, there's a dorsal circulation, but because this is a ring avulsion, everything has been um, avulsed. Take uh, that vein graft from the volar forearm. Remember, you can take this with skin as a free venous flap. Um, those micro ligger clips are very useful. It just makes it nice and fast. You don't want to have any thermal injury on the vessel. Um, and do the micro. This is the, this is the part of the operation which actually shouldn't be the most difficult. It should be the part which is the most controlled. Um, and he did well. He took a while to heal. And maybe you can see the vein graft filling up and the finger now um, perfused. Um, maybe I would have actually done a free venous flap for him. And this is actually an interesting case that came to us recently um, at the Royal Free. So actually referred as a tuft fracture um, by uh, another department. And he, when I saw him in clinic, I thought that they put some adrenaline in his finger, but it's actually it just completely degloved. So this is a Baniac 3. So interestingly, he had the tendon and bone and everything was intact. Uh, so we tried to salvage his digit and we just re-gloved uh, re it, extended right up to the DIP joint uh, to find vessel and do, did this vein graft. And he's, he's, we're still following him up. He's doing okay. Um, it survived. There is an area of ischemia just on the volar side. Maybe I should have used the arterialized flow through flap, but I'm going to follow him up and see how he does. And we did repair one of his nerves. So you've got to repair. The nerves were quite difficult to find. They've been injured, but you've got to repair something. So this is the arterialized flow through venous flap that you can use if there's a soft tissue defect and the finger is devascularized. It's a useful flap to do. And Borbak Safa in his paper uh, recommends using it quite a lot. He's got a great case on a pediatric case that, um, that he salvaged a digit using this flap. Um, you can also use islanded flaps from um, the index uh, uh, taking the radial digital artery. So this is a case uh, from Jimbo Tang's uh, paper, and he shows taking the radial digital artery to revascularize the amputated thumb and cover soft tissue. I've never done that, but I think the rare event that you may need to do that. Um, so you need to have these little tips and tricks in your, in your, in your background. And also venous flaps, I, I've had problems um, with um, congestion and I think shunt restriction is useful. This is another good paper from, from an Italian group and um, very useful um, uh, to, to, to use these uh, shunt restriction using the micro ligger. You can also include the palmaris longus as well in this flap um, and just just to touch on this, uh, this is rare ectopic replantation described by Godina. Um, I haven't uh, had any experience with this, but it, essentially Godina did, uh, I think, one case where he replanted uh, the arm ectopically into the thoracodorsal uh, system. Maybe that case at the beginning, which I showed that arm replant, I did suggest that to the other surgeon in the other theater to replant it ectopically and you could put it onto the groin or to, to the, uh, the, the thoracodorsal. And if, if it's basically, um, uh, there's a, the wound is very contaminated, there's a big soft tissue defect, you should think about that. And same with the thumb. Um, you can do that with the thumb. Um, and I think uh, this is an old paper by John Youssef, uh, but there's also a new, uh, there's a recent paper by Stephen Lowe's group in Cannesburn, and they described doing an ectopic, uh, replantation of the thumb. So it's a staged process. You've got to, it's very rare instances that you would need it probably once or twice in a consultant's career that they would need to do that. Um, and this is a good paper by Simon Kay, just 
on upper repl uh, limb replantations. Uh, they do describe a case of ectopic replantation, which I really highly recommend that you guys read. Um, and just to touch upon, because of all the pandemic, we're doing a lot of things under local. This is possible to do things under local anesthetic. You don't necessarily need to use adrenaline. I find you can use adrenaline. The advantages I've noticed is that you can find the neurovascular bundles very easily because you can see the pulsations um, and you can do replants or revasks like that. So this is a guy who came to see us um, uh, and um, they're all free. And he basically had a near total amputation of his finger and both, uh, uh, both neurovascular bundles were divided. It was like an oblique amputation um, finger was devascularized. Um, and unfortunately, there was a segmental gap and he really wanted his finger saved. Um, and so what we did was a bridging vein graft. And this was all done under local and uh, you can see it working here. You've got to be careful to size your vein graft. This, it worked. Um, you can see this kind of bridging vein graft here. This is in uh, Wu's paper. Um, so this, this can be very useful. And you can see the amputation is kind of like oblique like that. Um, and he's got just this skin bridge uh, remaining. And, um, you know, he did well. And it, we just did it very quickly, just a single KY across the joint. And he's happy with that. Um, and um, uh, so that's, that's that guy. And I think just, just to summarize those cases, obviously you shouldn't replant everything. And some cases may do better without it. Um, you need to have a, a microsurgical culture in your department. So I think to do these cases, you need to try to be doing uh, free flaps often, um, whether electively or trauma, and do cases frequently under the microscope, particularly in low volume centers. So in our center, I mean, I, I don't, I've probably done four or five uh, replant revasks in the last year. Um, but I do a lot of other things in terms of uh, free flap. So try to keep your hand in and repair. When you, well, I was doing this as a registrar, I tried to, if I was repairing multiple digital nerves, try to do it under the microscope. It's actually easier and it doesn't take long to set up the microscope. And if, if there is a big vessel there, just repair it. Um, and be, the, the important thing is, you know, be prepared for it when it really counts, where you've got a, a child who's, um, yeah, by accident amputated three fingers and you've got to do everything you can to save that that child's hand or you've got to save a thumb so you've got to be prepared and um, and this is just a nice picture from a sunny day in Hampstead and uh, I hope um, I hope uh, you guys enjoyed the talk um, is uh, I hope I didn't overrun Dimmy no that was absolutely perfect thank you Darish that was yes. a really interesting talk. Great cases at the end as well. And just really yeah. interesting to see the range of different presentations you see and how you manage them slightly differently. And yeah. also the tips and tricks. That's the key thing for us to learn, I think, and to take into our clinical practice. So thank you so much. We've got yes. quite, a lot, quite a lot of questions there, actually. We'll oh, okay. Back into a few of them. A, f a few people have asked, um, going back to your indications for replantation, why is it that when an amputation occurs proximal to the FDS insertion, is that a relative contraindication, despite the vessels being smaller distally? Um, I think if it's, if it's single digit proximal, they may, it may become a nuisance and stiffness. I think it goes back to uh, papers written by Graham Lister. Um, but that guy that I did, I think his PIP joint was just fused. Um, you can get, I mean, they've got to, they've got to get used to it. Maybe it's a manual worker and that index finger would get in the way and he'd just prefer it amputated. That's why you need to look at the long-term outcomes of these cases. You can't just say that I've saved that finger. It's a success because it's a bit like lower limb flaps. Um, you want to see the patient at a year, make sure that they haven't had the leg amputated. So that's something that's interesting. And I don't think it's easy to, to, to figure out um, in one center, particularly in the UK, where our health and safety is, is probably a little bit better than some other countries in the world, where they get much more frequent replantations, like Ganga Hospital, the amazing department, they're much more experienced than us because of the 
the magnitude of cases they get. I mean, we've got a lot of centralization of our trauma, which is X in the UK. So in London, it's at King's and at the Royal London. So they would get these kind of macro replants and big cases more frequently um, than centers like the, where, where I work. Lovely, thank you. Um, quite a few questions regarding vein grafts and the um, venous flow through flaps. Yeah. First, with regards to the vein grafts, you touched on it um, as with, with regards to what's your preferred donor vein graft. So where do you harvest it? So if it's for a digital replant, I take it from the, the distal third of the volar forearm and I mark it up before and then I, I reverse the vein graft. Um, you need to make sure that you take a, a vein graft which is an uh, exact match because you don't want it to kink. And I've done that before as a mistake. And I remember my consultant, um, Adi Scrinster, taking it down and we had to redo it. So you, you don't want to make, make that mistake. So I've done it in training, but uh, it, it works well. And it's something that you can do very easily. And you can take that volar tissue as well as an arterialized venous flow through flap if you've got a soft tissue defect as well. Lovely, thank you. I think you answered all the questions there in one go. So everyone, with regards to the venous flow through flaps, I think that's covered that as well. Lovely. Um, a few questions coming in just with regards to recordings and the slides. These will be made available in the next few weeks once we've edited slightly for any um, clinical images that have to be covered up. And then they'll be available on the Plaster website, which you can get access to by going to plaster.org and joining there. So just to answer those questions. Um, a few questions with regards to proximal replantations. Um, mm -hmm. One's quite interesting from Thomas um, Sudrajat, who asks, yes. if you do have a proximal amputation higher than the forearm, what's your view on perhaps reducing muscle mass to improve the replant success rate? Um, I mean, I think it could, once you debride it, I think um, you, if you debride everything, um, you probably will reduce the muscle mass. Um, but you've got, I mean, I don't have much experience in terms of macro replantation because a lot of the work that I do is elective microsurgery and digital re re replantations. A lot of it goes to the major trauma centers. But I think the important thing with those types of replant is shortening the bone, um, trying to hook up as much as you can, um, getting everything. Um, it, getting the, the nerves back and uh, um, suturing what you can. Uh, I think there's a, if you want good papers to read on that, um, um, the, the Ganga group have got ex excellent lectures on that. Um, I mean, the case that, that we did actually had quite a lot of muscle mass and we did have to do fasciotomies on that patient. So I think the really important thing is to do fasciotomies uh, in those cases, particularly with proximal uh, replantations, particularly if the ischemic time is 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 high. Lovely, thank you. And yeah, we had a, a really good webinar by Harry Venkatramani a couple of weeks ago yes. from Langa on upper limb uh, trauma, which will be available on the PAST website as well. So that's another one to check out in conjunction with Darish's recording as well. And there's quite a few questions just from a technical point of view, um, yeah. with regards to your setup in theatre and a few people have asked with regards to your tourniquet time, do you have any tips for minimizing the tourniquet time? Are there times that you can remove it and then put it back on or would you? So I would have the tourniquet up um, when you're preparing the vessels. Um, I showed you those steps. Read Barbak Safa's papers, exactly the steps that I described in my talk. Um, in terms of once you find you, your vessels, um, it's not going to take you long. You know, extend the wound back outside the zone of trauma, um, repair repair the structures there, the the uh, the nerves under the under the tourniquet. Um, in terms of uh, um, once you put the I always take the tourniquet down and just check the arterial um, kind of inflow. Actually, Barbak Safa he doesn't do that. He just visualizes the vessel under the microscope and makes a decision like that but I'd just like to see good proximal flow. Um, I mean, if you're just gonna put a single K wire down, um, that shouldn't take you long. Um, if you've got, 
if you've got an assistant with you as well, and if you've prepared the amputated piece and you've tagged all the structures, all of this buys you time. I mean, if you're doing a single digit replant, it should take you two to three hours. It shouldn't be taking you all night um, to do it, unless it's something that you've got to redo. It's a thumb, you know, it's a crush avulsion injury. But, you know, if it's a crush avulsion injury, should you be doing it? So you, I mean, you've got to, what I do is I, if it's an injury like that, I, I give it a go. Um, particularly if somebody really wants to save it, and it's a child or uh, someone who's like a professional musician or something. Um, but the efficiency, it comes with experience and you've got to keep doing micro cases. And um, uh, I, th I think uh, throughout, throughout my training, I had a lot of opportunities, but I had a lot of failures in terms of replantation. So you become better, you learn from your mistakes as well. Absolutely, thank you. Um, there's a few questions about your preparation of the vessels um, and how much of the adventitia do you clean off and do you use Hepsal or any other? Yeah, I use Hepsal. Um, I try to clean the vessels as much as possible, um, get it nice and clean, as I showed in those pictures earlier. Um, and um, I mean, uh, uh, Hep Saline, is, I find that very useful. You can use um, papaverin, but it does give crystals. So I sometimes use um, lidocaine or verapamil. Um, I do a lot of the dissection under the microscope. So if I've done the artery and then I close up under the microscope and then I turn the hand around and I identify the vessels, the veins under the microscope as well, it can speed things up as well if you use the microscope. Lovely, thank you. Um, and a few questions, one from, again from Sergio Vallejo, who asked with regards to your anticoagulation protocol that you touched on um, and you discussed the review. Um, what's your preferred mode of... Um, so I think, I mean, Dimi, you wrote the paper, so I should ask yeah. you. So, I mean, uh, I, I think uh, I use low molecular weight heparin because I think there's low, less problems with IV than IV heparin. And there's less kind of systemic side effects. Um, so we use a prophylactic dose. I think we use Clexane at the Royal Free. Um, and aspirin, I use a low dose of aspirin, 75 milligrams. Some people use 325 milligrams. But again, no consensus in the literature. Um, some people use IV heparin, particularly if they've had to redo um, anastomoses for a macro replant. But I have seen a lot of problems with IV heparin and complications, and it's hard to control um, the, the coagulation in IV heparin. Um, so what, what do you think, Dimi, as well, from your, your article? Well, I agree with that. There's no consensus. IV heparin has, I mean, the transfusion rate in patients who have IV heparin is, I think, four or five times higher um, yeah. and without significant increase in the replant success. Um, yeah. I think, yeah, there's a lot of variation from center to center, so that's why there's no consensus in the literature. Um, and some units even don't use any thromboprophylaxis at all and have reports of case series of up to 30 replants consecutively without any failures without replant or without thromboprophylaxis so mm -hmm. a lot of people talk to um the microsurgical technique as being much more important um mm -hmm. and two weeks of aspirin seems to be enough in most cases as well yeah Especially so someone said venous and... congestion in the digit solution so yeah if it's on the ward i i order the leeches so <laughs> interesting when I, I briefly visited taiwan and they didn't have leeches there, but uh, so you, they did chemical leaching. That's another way of doing it. So make a, a little kind of shave in the nail at the end of the operation and then chemically leach it. Um, but you've got to leach for quite a few days, five to seven days, and you've got to check the HP. Um, also, they said, no, if you don't find a proper vein, usually in very distal replants, I mean, you can, uh, again, do chemical leaching. Um, that's another thing that you can do. Um, and uh, uh, I think uh, aseptic conditions, is that the next anonymous attendee has asked? Yeah, that's essentially the preparation of the vessels on, of the amputated part. I think they mean under the microscope. Yeah, so yeah. I wash that amputated bit in some uh, um, saline. Um, you can even wash it under the theater tap. There's a nice uh, pictures in Barbak Safa's paper that 
he shows a hand replant, the resident is washing it out. Um, you've got to get it clean. You've got to debride all of the crap off it. Um, and uh, um, I mean, that, that's, uh, that's something that um, for, particularly for macro replants is pretty important. Lovely. We'll just do a couple more questions, guys, yeah. in the interest of time. Um, one question here, I think a couple of you have asked it, with yeah. regards to the extensors. Do you repair these before the bony fixation? Um, so I, I repair the flexors um, uh, f first and then the, everything on the bowler side and then I go, go to the dorsal side. I think in more distal replants, it doesn't really matter if you repair the extensor or not. Um, and actually a friend of mine, um, I think worked in Chelmsford, said that they had that same experience, but I, I don't have the that big experience that they have at, um, uh, at uh, Chelmsford, but like uh, I would, um, I would, uh, you know, the extensors I would leave to the end. So if it's, I've never had a case, but I'm sure I will one day where you've got an amputation through the MCP heads um, and uh, I would consider repairing the extensors first and the veins and then doing the volar structures. Um, so um, that could be useful. Yeah, interesting. Um, a, a few people have asked this question, so we'll, including Assad Matpool, who asks, if you do have a proximal amputation and replantation, is this the same sequence of bone, tendon, nerve, artery? Yes, uh, if it's like a, that, um, arm replant that I showed. So try to repair the bone first. You can put a shunt there. So a pediatric catheter or a Javid shunt. Um, and uh, just to buy you some time. Interesting in that case, it didn't work very well. But if you do the osteosynthesis very quickly, um, then you can get to the arterial anastomosis. And the really the important thing is shortening the bone. Um, and I think the guys, the Ganga guys, who've got loads of experience, I, I, I saw uh, that they do that quite frequently. Yeah, yeah, they're really good. Um, and I think last question here um, mm. from Martin Van Carlen, who asks, do you, what's your recommendations or advice for taking a case back to theatre if it's congested yeah. or if it's looking to be a bit pale as well or do you think one go i'll use like i'll use um that case that i did that ring avulsion that i did recently i said to the registrar like this is the only go you know we're not going to take that back to theater he really wants his digits saved um but let's say if it was a hand replant or a amputation on a child um, and it became congested or pale or something happened i take it back to theater i treat it like a free flap essentially so uh, if it's a Dieppe flap, which I do quite a lot of, the, if, if the Dieppe flap has gone down or congested, I'd take it back to theatre. Um, I think we've got a, a lower tendency to take back replants in the UK. I saw in the Far East, they're more kind of aggressive to take it back. And their reasoning is true. If you've spent a couple of hours doing something, then you might as well you know, take it back. Um, but it has to be for sensible reasons as well, because you don't want to, you know, do long operations that could potentially harm patients. Lovely. I think that's a, a good note to end on. Sorry if we haven't answered your questions, guys. There's quite a few been asked and we've gone through, I think, 20 or so questions. So um, yeah. thanks. Do you everyone. want me to send any of these papers to you? Well, a lot, a lot of people have asked for the papers. The talk will be available on the Plaster website. Yeah. But if you're able to to send the papers, we can we can make them available as well. Yeah, I can I can send them um, these the three papers, especially Wayne Morrison's paper. Yeah. I thought that that story about the tug of war, um, yeah. I'll never forget that. <laughs> you can imagine that. Yeah. Um, we're having a lot of comments in saying great presentation, sir. Thank you very much. Oh, thank especially you for the tips and tricks. Thank you again. Yeah. Um, thank you for that wonderful webinar. So thank you so much, thank everyone. You. That's Take really care, really everyone, really and um, hopefully see you soon. Take care. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Sarah. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. And just before we go, everyone, um, I'll just tell you about next Tuesday's webinar. I'll post the link now in the chat so you can copy and paste this or click on it if you're able to. It'll be with Professor Mosahibi, who's also from the Royal Free Hospital, um, but talking on a different topic on fat transfer. Um, so quite a different topic, but the varied uses of fat 
and fat transfer in plastic surgery. Uh, he's a great speaker, so you're going to enjoy that. Yeah, he's a great speaker and a great teacher. So that'll be another great webinar. The, the link is there for you to access and sign up today. So we look forward to seeing you again this time next week. But for today, thank you very much, Darish. And thank you everyone again for attending. I'll just leave the link here for a minute or two and then we'll close the webinar. Lovely. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a good evening and rest of the day. We look forward to seeing you next week. Bye-bye.